Time now for my political panel, Labor MP Christy McBain and Liberal MP Jason Falinski. Welcome to both of you. Good afternoon. Jason, I want to start um, on that big story in relation to the Biloela family. Do you want them to be resettled in Australia? Uh, look, my personal view on that is, yes, I think it would be good if they were resettled in Australia, but I understand that there are court processes that we need to go through those processes, that these are difficult decisions. There are a lot of considerations that need to be part of it. And this is, in and of itself, a very difficult case where a number of tribunals and a number of courts have found that they don't um, meet the status of refugees. But obviously, since then, um, things have moved on. and. We have now a whole bunch of other considerations that means um, that some of the decisions that are being reported this afternoon, um, I guess, come into play. Yeah, it looks like um, the Immigration Minister could actually give them the chance to stay in Australia. We don't know for how long, um, even tomorrow. Uh, would you welcome that? Would you prefer it, Jason, to be a longer-term visa or a permanent visa rather than just a short-term answer? Look, PK, I mean, these are, I mean, you know, I'm always reminded of that George Byrne line that it's too bad all the people best qualified to make these decisions are busy driving cabs and cutting hair. Mm. Um, but look, I'm, I'm here in Australia because my grandparents and my father made the very brave decision to leave Eastern Europe, or East Europe um, after World War II and come to Australia. It was a very difficult decision and I'm ever grateful for them to have made that courageous decision and for Australia for being a country that is open, welcoming, one of the most ethnically diverse and multicultural countries in the world. And I know that this is a government that wants to um, continue to have that reputation and enhance that reputation and live consistently by that reputation that so many other generations have worked so hard to build. Christy, uh, you've heard there that Jason would like this family to come to Australia and we know that the government is poised to make an announcement. Uh, what does the announcement need to look like to satisfy you? Well, I think the announcement needs to look like something with some compassion and humanity around it. I mean, we've got two girls who were born in Australia here. Um, you know, they should be back in the, the town that they've known basically their whole lives in Billa Wheeler. You know, we ask people to uh, not only bring their culture, um, but respect ours as well. Uh, and you've got a family here that went and settled in a regional location, they worked hard, they volunteered in their local community, they were raising their kids in a local community uh, and now they've been separated from that community for close to three years. So, you know, it shouldn't be a short-term decision made by this government, it should be a decision to return uh, a family with two Australian-born girls to a community that wants them uh, and, and that respects uh, them for their cultural diversity. And I know, Jason Falinski, that the Acting Prime Minister has since clarified that he misspoke today about the family being reunited and that's, you know, genuinely reunited, the, the father and the sibling with the mother and, and the, sick, the sick child. I spoke to the family friend Simone Cameron earlier and she said the family had heard Michael McCormack's comments and, you know, thought this was going to happen but then uh, obviously got the wrong message or we don't know. It's pretty important, isn't it, to get these things right. This family is incredibly vulnerable. Uh, absolutely. It's always important to get these things right. And look, Michael is, um, uh, Michael is, uh, you know, our Deputy Prime Minister, he's the Acting Prime Minister at the moment. Um, but um, believe it or not, he's also a human being and he makes mistakes. And I, knowing Michael as I do, I'm sure he's regretting anything that he, may, uh, that he said that may have caused people any anxiety. That would have been the um, thing furthest from his mind when he made those comments. Yeah, but, but on the actual substantive issue, shouldn't they be reunited? I mean, it's a six-hour flight, isn't it? Shouldn't the father and the other daughter be brought back so the family is together? I know I'd want my family together in such a crisis. Yeah, I mean, we all would, and, and I'm certainly with you on that one, PK. Um, look, the fact of the, is that those processes are under consideration now. Um, I, I'm reading in The Australian at the moment that the minister is set to make that announcement, um, but uh, you'll be surprised to hear that journalists know more than I do. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. Right. But look, th these are not easy um, considerations for anyone in that position, and um, I know that Alex has been looking at this for quite some time and he'll be trying to expedite that decision as quickly as he can. Chris, Christy, was it just I, a I mistake would... by Michael McCormack? <laughs> Well, I, I would hope that reuniting a family, going through a, you know, a horrible situation with a child in hospital at the moment, 
that it is an easy situation. I mean, I've had the unfortunate situation of having a child hospitalised on more than one occasion. Um, on one occasion, we were transferred from a local hospital to a to a tertiary hospital uh, away from home. Um, and what I needed and what my child needed at that point of, in time was for us all to be together. Um, logistically, it was a little bit hard, but we made it work. Um, and right now, you've got ministers who can make decisions to reunify this family, uh, and that should be done. That should be done out of compassion, uh, and there shouldn't have to be a huge convoluted process to go through and Jason shouldn't be reading about it in the Australian. Jason should be knocking on the minister's door saying, can you, with a flick of your pen, sort out this family getting back together? Jason, have you done that? Uh, yes, I've spoken to Alex about this. He, he knows my views and, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave that conversation between me and Alex. Okay. And you're not the only one that's spoken to Alex, and you're referring to, for those who don't know who you're referring to, the Immigration Minister, Alex Hawke. So obviously there's been a really big internal shift or a push for this to happen. What changed? Why are so many people um, concerned about this family? Oh, look, I don't think there's been that much change. I think what's changed, PK, and what has the dynamic that's changed is obviously... Um, uh, a little, girl, a little girl has had to be brought back to Australia for medical treatment, and that obviously changes everything, as, as uh, Christy just made clear. Um, you know, my daughter has been in hospital too, and the last thing that I think I could have coped with is being forcibly separated from her. And um, this is not unusual. This, um, this has happened previously. There are um, protocols in place for the government to handle this. OK. Um, and, and obviously this has gone on and on and on. Um, they've been detained on Christmas Island since 2019. Um, Jason, um, it's just been too long, hasn't it, to have a family detained like this at such great expense for so long? Well, um, PK, you need to go and speak to the federal court about that. I mean... No, um, the federal had... government, you know they had the power to do something on it. I mean, they could have done something a lot earlier than, than after the, the little girl was hospitalised. Well, PK, the fact of the matter remains that we live in a country of laws where those decisions are not made by government ministers but are made by um, judges. Um, there were a number of tribunals and a number of courts that ruled that this family did not um, meet the standard refugee status. Uh, Justice Bromberg at the last moment, I think as they were on a plane, and the plane had to be um, landed in uh, Darwin to comply with the federal court injunction, decided to reverse some of those um, decisions. Now, that's a decision that the federal court will have to answer for. That has led to this prolonged process. Um, uh, I, I can use the word regrettable, but it doesn't even begin to touch on how I feel about the situation. No. Well, I, I want you to use the language you want to use then. If, if regrettable isn't a good enough word, what is it? It's... Look, I'm, I'm just... Bluntly, I'm angry about this whole process that the court, that, um, the court system has imposed on the Australian people. So we have laws in this country and we've had a justice at the last minute um, reverse those decisions, impose an injunction on um, a government that was trying to uh, um, execute a decision of the federal court that has ended up in this family being in pur um, purgatory um, for uh, two years. It, it's just, I mean, look, it, I don't want to be in contempt of court, but you have to ask yourself, did, was anyone actually thinking about the consequences of that decision when it was made? Yeah, but the government, we've talked about how the minister's got a ministerial discretion and power. The government's mm. culpable well, the here minister too. Has a, the, the minister has a discretionary power now, um, and look, the government has been trying... I mean, no one has been sitting back saying, oh, yes, we're just going to let this um, situation roll. Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, and indeed, this is, not, uh, a, um, this is not an issue that just arrived yesterday. It has been going on for quite some time, and there's been lots of discussions about it. Um, people have been trying to move on resolving this issue for quite some time. But the government, as any government should be, is hampered by the court processes and the laws that we have in place. Oh, all right. Christy, do you accept? Can I just, yeah, can sure. I just point out, though, that it, at any given point, the government could have pulled out of court action. 
So you have made a conscious decision to also go into those court proceedings uh, and make sure that those laws are enforced. You know, there are conscious so, decisions so, that have been made well, throughout sorry, the process with, with about what you've yeah. done in the yeah. court process as well. Yeah. So, look, yeah. One minute. Like I think Christy Jason Kent. and I are probably in agreement that, you know, Right now, we're two and a half years down the track and something has to be done. Um, and, and that's the situation we're currently dealing with. Uh, but there's been conscious decisions made through, throughout this process as well. Jason? So in response to that, I would have to say governments do not have a choice what laws they wish to um, uphold and not uphold. No, 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 no. But, but, but yes. obviously joining court actions and being involved in court actions is an active decision. That's, that's a fact. Governments, PK, surely you understand this. I do, I do. When, I'm laws, are, when laws are passed by the parliament, governments have both not only um, the right but the responsibility to uphold those laws. Otherwise, we just become, uh, I don't know, anarchy. Where, where you know, okay. one government says, well, I'm going to enforce the laws that were passed by this parliament, but previous sessions of parliament, I've decided I don't yeah, like yeah, those yeah. laws. So, the so everyone, bottom don't line, worry, Jason, we're not going bottom to try line is. Do you hold the courts responsible, but you are desperate for this family to come to Australia, right? That's the bottom line, absolutely. And I don't think there are many other people who, who disagree with that situation. Um, OK, we're going to park that story because there's another big story I want to talk about with both of you before I say goodbye to both of you and then the show. The G7, Australia signed clean energy agreements with Germany and Japan. Um, and also, you know, this promise, as you know, Jason, to to phase out investment into coal-fired power. Um, do you welcome those commitments? Absolutely. I think they're fantastic news. I think that we've got, um, you know, a really difficult task ahead of us globally to transition to net zero by 2050. It's a task that we have to reach. Um, these agreements are incredibly important because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. I think green hydrogen is, as um, the former uh, chief scientist Alan Finkel has pointed out, is a really important road path or, or um, path towards net zero. Um, these sorts of alliances globally are going to be critically important. And, you know, the sooner Australia does this, the sooner we can sort of park, um, set ourselves up with first mover advantage uh, with the future of energy. Christy, are you, do you welcome the, these moves that the government's made at these international meetings? Yeah, look, I do. Um, you know, it's been interesting because, uh, you know, I think Scott Morrison's probably largely been sidelined on the, the G7 because of our inaction on things like climate change. And it's interesting to hear Jason's comments and I, and I welcome them uh, because if, uh, you know, my, my normal uh, uh, sidekick here, Matt Canavan, was, was here, I, I'm not sure he'd be as pleased uh, with the two agreements that have been uh, reached uh, at the G7 by the Prime Minister. Um, but, you know, we are still a long way off. I mean, setting a, a net zero by 2050 target from this government might be a good start um, locally. And, uh, you know, any action is great, um, but let's hope it's actually met with some action uh, here. Well, Jason, there you go. She prefers you as a sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Always happy to be Kirsty's sidekick. <laughs> Christy's sidekick. Kirstie, yeah, Christy's sidekick. Sorry, Jason, sorry, sorry. I, I, that's fine. I just spoke um, to Dr Tracy Westerman on the program. She's been appointed a member of the Order of Australia for her significant service to the Indigenous community in mental health and suicide prevention, and she's just such a uh, wonderful person to talk to. People should really watch that interview. We're called Afternoon Briefing. Look it up on iView. Sorry, had to get a plug in. Um, now, we spoke about the, the push to raise the age of criminal responsibility. It's, it's 10. Um, which is incredibly young. Do you want to see a stronger commitment to, to seeing that raised? Um, look, that's probably not... I mean, this is obviously a state government question. Sure, um, but the federal government's so coordinating the process. I've, I've given a lot of time to thought to. But the bigger issue, I think, is uh, recidivism rates, um, both um, especially amongst children. Um, and, look, uh, I think that's really the big question for all of us. How do we get recidivism rates lower um, than they are at the moment? And it seems that when people are... Um, you know, how do we break um, that, uh, I, I don't know, that history of where people get caught once and then they seem to end up in this system where their choices narrow and narrow and narrow to a life of crime? And that's 
the thing that I've, I've kind of been focused on in the past. Yeah, but I suppose yeah. uh, if you're a 10 year old and you have had that interaction with the criminal justice system, um, if you look at the evidence, you're more likely to keep having those interactions with the criminal justice system if you um, yep. have them from such a young age, right? Yep, and that's um, and that's what we need to change. That's absolutely. I mean, there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of policy areas around um, recurring poverty and cycles of poverty and intergenerational poverty that we need to break. And I, and crime is more, I have to say, a symptom than I think the underlying cause of it. Mm. And so where the rates are, and I I, I would be in the hands of an expert yeah. um, rather than anything I have to say, but the areas um, where we need to e um, invest and deploy education um, really, really strongly because that is what really breaks those cycles is um, something that I think um, I think we as a nation need to look at more closely. What do you think, Christy? Uh, well, I have an 11-year-old. Um, her brain's not fully developed and there is still a lot of uh, reaction, um, uh, you know, issues that take place. So I I'd like to see us actually take another look at this because um, it is very much about education and treating people who have perhaps made wrong decisions a little bit differently when uh, they're, as, uh, as, a, as you said, as young as 10 being held criminally responsible for things. So, look, there's a lot more that needs to happen in that space because we know that uh, children's brains aren't fully developed by that age um, and decision-making capacity isn't at its greatest. So uh, we need to really look at this um, and there are a whole range of other issues uh, that, that should be dealt with uh, rather than just going through the criminal justice system. Yeah, Christy, I have a 10-year-old too and it just... Um, I find it very hard to wrap my head around the concept that um, someone so little could ever be uh, having an interaction like that or be in juvenile detention. It's incredible. Thank you to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry to make it out like my child's that small, but she's quite small. Uh, Labor MP <laughs> Christy McBain and Liberal MP Jason Falinski joining me there.